Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our series of webinars. My name is Bradley Wiseman, and I'm a board member with Canadian Friends of Peace Now. We are partners to Peace Now Shalom Achshav, which is Israel's leading peace movement and which promotes the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You can find out more about us, and if you wish, support us with a donation by going to our website, peacenowcanada.org. That's peacenowcanada.org, and you can find a link in the chat just below your screen. We are honored to have some wonderful guests with us today. Dana Mills is the Director of Development and External Relations for Peace Now. Sam Sussman is the co-founder and director of Extend. And Abby Kirschbaum is an assistant director of public engagement and educational resources of J Street. Also with us today are two people who have gone on alternative tours to Israel, Adam De Shriver and Ariella Sylvan, who will tell us about their travel experience with J Street and with Extend. As always, we welcome your questions and we'll try to get as many of them in as you can. Please type your questions in at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And please do not use the chat function for questions. And also we recommend that you set your Zoom screen to speaker view in order to uh, enjoy the webinar. Lastly, our webinar will be recorded and posted to our website. Now, it's my pleasure to turn things over to my co-host and fellow board member, Daniela Weisman. Daniela, over to you. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, so our first question today goes to you, Dana Mills. Uh, why do you think it's important for youth travelers to go beyond birthright or other mainstream trips? Uh, what is wrong with a more traditional tour of Israel? First of all, thank you all for coming and thank you for organizing this webinar, which is really important on many levels. Um, I want to talk about beyond and not against what is considered here the, the traditional trip, because I want to say that us in Peace Now, Shalom Achshav, the movement in which I work, in which I grew up, I joined Peace Now as a teenager when I was 13. Um, we aim to focus our efforts on achieving the two-state solution, on showing the reality of the occupation. Part of what Israel is right now is the occupation of the territories, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Yesterday, we marked exactly 54 years of the beginning of the occupation. Understanding what is happening on the ground and what we need to do in order to achieve the two-state solution is part of the reality of living in Israel and of being part of the Israeli community, both locally and abroad. So we believe very strongly and try to facilitate that, that while showing the entire um, experience of what it's like to be in Israel, you actually understand the country much better. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Abby and Sam, do you have anything to add to uh, those opening lines? I do actually. Um, hi again. Also very nice to be here. Um, really amazing topic that you're talking about today and I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues discussing it. Um, so I would also, you know, on J Street's behalf, um, I would very much have to kind of agree with what Dana is talking about, about, you know, showing Israel um, is not just about talking about Israel, it's, you know, going a little bit deeper and talking about Palestine as well and really digging into what, what Palestine means and, you know, um, not being afraid to talk about the reality of this 54 year long occupation. Um, I think something else that's really important is to be able to um, clarify that young Jewish people who are going on these beyond birthright types of trips, they also have a stake in Israel-Palestine. Um, that might mean morally, financially, um, but as Jewish North Americans, um, we very much have a stake for a variety of reasons. And I think being able to critically assess what's being carried out in our names um, as Jewish North Americans is a critical piece of uh, these tours to Israel-Palestine. And so, um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Great. Thank you for um, that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, Donna, I couldn't agree more. Let me add a few things. Um, so I'm Sam from Extend. Since 2013, Extend has been running programs. We've brought more than 600 young American Jews to Israel and the occupied territories. And I want to explain a little bit about why we started this program in 2013 and why we've kept doing it. I think 
in the North American community more broadly, there's a habit of talking about Palestinians without talking to Palestinians. I think one of the consequences of that is that um, many people who engage on this issue, who consider themselves knowledgeable, aren't really facing the moral urgency of what the occupation looks like on a daily basis for the Palestinians who live under it. So I, I think one of the other things that gets missed there is also the Palestinians and Israelis who are working for a more sustainable future. So on extend, um, we emphasize both of those things. Um, we go to uh, you know we, we go to communities that are under threat of demolition just because they happen to be situated between two growing settlements, and we don't look away from that. We acknowledge that that's part of what it means for Palestinians to live under military occupation, and we give platforms for Palestinians to talk about their experiences and how living under occupation shapes their lives. But we don't just focus on what's going wrong. We also give platforms to Israelis and Palestinians who are doing incredibly courageous and brave and humanistic work in creating a future of mutual freedom. And that's not always just the pretty story, right? Like a lot of those people are getting tear gassed or they're, um, they're really suffering the cost of that courageous activism. And I, I think one of the problems with how we talk about Israel's Palestine more broadly is that when rockets are fired, when there's violence, everyone pays attention, right? Um, but when someone organizes a nonviolent protest um, or when people draw on those really deep moral tools of political tra transformation, there's not enough of attention paid. So Extend has been redirecting the energy and attention of young American Jews towards those realities, both what's wrong with the occupation and what's right with how Israelis and Palestinians are working together to end it. Thank you, Sam and Abby, for those important observations. Um, our next question uh, goes to all of you, all of our panelists. Uh, how do the tours offered by Extend, J Street, and Peace Now uh, go beyond Israeli national narratives to include Palestinian perspectives and experiences? Uh, so, Abby, you can start with you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, to answer your question, um, so I think one thing that J Street really focused on, and I'm, I'm talking about a particular trip that we organized in 2019. You can see Adam DeShriver was one of our participants on that trip. Um, so on that trip, we really focused on thinking about the importance of, um, of geographic location and how it affects individuals. You know, you might have a Palestinian based in East Jerusalem, a West Bank resident, um, a resident of Area C, which is, you know, uh, an area of the West Bank, which is 60% of the West Bank, and it's under the military and civil jurisdiction of the Israeli state, um, and, you know, Palestinian citizens of Israel as well. So when we were trying to, uh, you know, convey the varying realities of the Palestinian narrative on this trip, we really thought a lot about this, these sort of ge geographic locational varieties. And so that was one of the key things for us, you know, a bit of what Sam talked about, you know, sometimes the Palestinian narrative is talked about without Palestinians actually doing their share of talking about um, their lived experience, so to speak. Um, that was really important to us. And so, you know, we did a lot of on that particular trip, it was really important for us to just be able to hear from this variety of different Palestinian narratives rather than this sort of monolith of, Pal of Palestinian um, you know, that we often hear about and have our, our, our various connotations in our minds about who a Palestinian is. It was really critical for us to be able to visit the places you know, hear uh, firsthand from the people who are, you know, maybe living in East Jerusalem and what being an East Jerusalem, East Jerusalemite means in, uh, versus being a resident of Area C versus being a resident of Ramallah, Bethlehem, Hebron. I mean, it's, you know, very, very stark realities based on miles, kilometers. Um, and so that was really important to us. And I think that's one of the ways that we, that we really, En enabled our participants to engage with the varying uh, Palestinian narratives. That's great. Thank you, Abby. And uh, Sam? So um, I'll start by saying Palestinian society is really diverse, and we try to capture that on our programs. So I'll give a few different examples of where we would go on a traditional five-day program. So we would go to Hebron. We would go to Nabi Saleh and Bilin, which are small communities which are at the forefront of the civil disobedience movement. 
Then we would go only 15 miles away, but to a very different environment. We'd go to like a nice restaurant out in Ramallah because we want people to see that that's also Palestinian experience, that that also exists. Um, we stay with a family that we've been partnering with for years in Jifna, which is a suburb of Ramallah. It's an affluent, um, mostly Christian community. So that right there is like four or five really different uh, experiences within Palestinian society. We also spend time in East Jerusalem um, because we think it's, it's really important. People often, um, when they talk about the occupation, they focus on the West Bank. They're not thinking about the ways that Palestinians uh, who live in Jerusalem, they aren't citizens and they're permanent residents. They face the whole host of civil rights issues because of that. And we really spend time getting into that. So we spend time, we walk around, we visit Sheikh Jarrah, which has been getting a lot of attention lately. Increasingly, we've also been spending time with communities that are Palestinian citizens of Israel, because we think that that's also something that's not focused on enough. I think one of the issues with birthright is that it really rarely spends time with this population that's 20% of Israeli society, right? That has a really crucial role in its future. And you know, we think, extend that if you're an American Jew coming to Israel to really understand the society, you have to engage with Palestinian citizens. So there's a really broad range of places that we spend time on extend everywhere from a small community where there's art made out of the tear gas canisters uh, that the IDF has used to disrupt protests um, to an affluent uh, restaurant in, in downtown Ramallah. And we're really trying to capture the breadth of that experience and give people a sense of the diversity of Palestinian society. Just to chat, tap into that, um, we do all of the above. We have very diverse tours. We go to all places mentioned, especially Hebron. We have tour a lot of East Jerusalem. A lot of our work right now focuses on East Jerusalem. We've been involved in the Sheikh Jarrah struggle for the past 11 years from when it basically started. And I wanted to, to sort of say something about something that Sam mentioned earlier that is really important. Um, we absolutely, one of the things we really, really work on is expanding in our own work also locally, the, the diversity of the Palestinian narrative, yes. But also for people who are coming here to understand the diversity of what it's like being an Israeli activist. So through doing a tour with Peace Now, you will also meet people your age who are part of the movement, who might be doing these tours once every week or going on protests once every week and will face tear gas and will face all of the things that you discussed. So. Yes, our focus is absolutely on diversifying the Palestinian experience, but also you understand the complexity of Israeli resistance and what it's like being descendant within your own country and what are the stakes of that, which I think is also really important for the stakes as outlined earlier in terms of the North American experience. Uh, so I would just like to address a question that came up in the chat and uh, that is just please clarify for us how young are the participants in your trips uh, in all three organizations? What is the age group? Um, so for, for us, for the 2019 trip, the Let Our People Know trip that we ran, um, we had uh, students starting from their first year of university um, until they were graduating. So basically from around age 18 or 19 to 22 to 23. Um, so basically university years. Uh, and for the, the day trips that our Israel team runs, the J Street Israel office team runs, uh, it's also typically gap year students. So finishing high school or secondary school, uh, and then um, so around 17 or 18, and then also um, university students who are doing their study abroad, um, maybe at Hebrew U or Tel Aviv University. So typically around university student age is, is where our uh, trips, is the age range of our trips. Um, so our programs run from gap year students who are 18 and 19 to college students, young professionals. Um, two summers ago, we ran a program for Hillel professionals who were spending the summer in Jerusalem. And we've also run programs for older folks. For We ran a program for uh, a group of reform rabbis a few years ago. So we, most of our, I'd say probably most of the people coming on the program are college students or young professionals, but we have a really wide range of participants. And I just want to follow up what, what Donna said. I, I do think that one of the, it's so, so important to highlight those Israeli activist voices. And I think that's, that often gets lost. And I, I think it's really one of the bigger issues with birthright is that they don't emphasize 
um, progressive Israeli society. Like I think I came off of my birthright trip thinking that the political spectrum went from Netanyahu on the left to uh, like Lieberman and Bennett on the right. You know, that was that was the sense. One of the things I felt I kind of got robbed of was a, a sense of meeting Israeli activists who really shared my progressive values. And I think a lot of young American Jews miss out on that because they're not introduced to that part of Israeli society. And, and I think it's it's a really big problem. So I just wanted to echo what Donna was saying. Thank you. And just to add on the age um, question, I'm going to take it to a, a slightly different direction, but one that is important, important to say that part of these tools is also talking and we have a lot of lectures before and we prepare participants because this is not an easy thing to go through. Like you can imagine what it's like going through a checkpoint. You can imagine what it's like walking through a check that up. It's not the same while you experience it. And I think one of the things we really try to give is the experience, but we also provide a lot of support and preparation. So it's not like we send you on a bus and say, here's the Hebron checkpoint. Good luck, see you on the other side. We'll meet for homos. So there's a lot of, what we, when we say tour, it's not just the physical tour. There's a lot of, there's a journey that goes on beyond the actual tour. Thank you for that. Um, so next we're going to focus on the itinerary of the trips. Um, so what parts of Israel and Palestine have the participants uh, visited and what people have they met uh, that they wouldn't have on their own or through the birthright uh, program? And who are the local guides? So we can start with Sam this time. Sure. Um, so I, I think I mentioned a few places, but, but uh, to give some examples. So we'll go to Hebron, we'll spend um, time on, on both sides. Um, so we'll spend time with breaking the silence, walking through, uh, probably a lot of people on, on this program have done that. Um, that's a sort of common experience for uh, North American Jews. And then we'll also go into the Palestinian portion of Hebron with Isa Amro, uh, who's a really inspiring Palestinian activist, maybe some people have heard of. Um, we'll spend time in East Jerusalem, as I mentioned, walking through Sheikh Jarrah, maybe in Silwan. Um, we'll spend time um, in Ramallah and then some of the communities around it, uh, like Nabi Salah or Berlin, which have very strong activist traditions. Um, we'll go north, we'll go to Nablus, we'll go, uh, we'll also spend time in Bethlehem. So we try to give a pretty diverse sense. Um, we also, in addition to doing sort of community visits, um, we also go places that I think are really important in understanding how the occupation works. So for example, we'll go to the Ofer military court and we'll watch a trial and we'll talk to both lawyers and Palestinian teenagers who are being processed through this system. This is, I think, really one of the more disturbing aspects of the occupation. About 700 uh, Palestinian teenagers every year go through this military court system. The conviction rate is over 99%. So we'll talk to lawyers, we'll talk to people and family members who have gone through that. Um, so we'll, we'll also do that sort of briefing to understand the, the situation from a legal perspective. So th that's a bit of the diversity. And then we also will come back uh, and usually end the program by meeting Israeli activist groups in Tel Aviv. And we wanna leave people with a sense of how can you get involved? What can you do? So again, Extend isn't just about showing people, oh, it's so, so bad. Now go home and be sad about it. We wanna end that program in Tel Aviv with um, people from the broader Israeli activist community sitting around a table and saying, here's how you can get involved. Um, here are the different things that you can do. So that's a little bit of a sense of, of where we go and, and what we focus on. And Abby, if you can address uh, the letter people know trip and um, the, also the day trips. Sure. Um, so for the 2019 letter people know trip, uh, there were definitely some parallels with what Sam mentioned. Um, we, you know, we covered a very large geographic expanse of Israel and Palestine. And uh, a lot of the, the themes that were brought up by Dana and Sam also uh, were featured on our trip. So for instance, we went to the Palestinian town of Sakhnin inside of Israel, which is in the Northern Galilee region, because it was also really critical for us to be able to shed light on the experience of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, you know, what, what do your rights look like? What does it mean to be a minority population in a Jewish state? Um, so that was a really critical piece of our tour. Uh, we also spent time in the West Bank, meaning that we went to Ramallah, we went to Hebron. Um, and, you know, again, uh, 
different uh, types of pers Palestinian perspectives. We also spent time in Jerusalem, in West and East Jerusalem to kind of understand what proximity means when you're in Jerusalem. Um, you know, we, we met, we, we had Shabbat dinners uh, with different families, with also Jewish Israeli activists and diaspora activists, which was really meaningful. Uh, Friends of J Street who hosted our participants, which was just a really meaningful way to connect uh, Jewishly and also just on a human level, have conversations with Jerusalem residents about what it means to live there. Uh, that was really meaningful for us. Um, we also visit a set, visited a settlement, uh, which was a very challenging experience for our participants. Um, and, you know, we really understood from the settlers why they were there, what their political motivations and aspirations were. Um, you know, this was a day after having visited Hebron, so there was quite a, um, just a difficult kind of contradiction in that meeting. Um, what else did we do? We visited um, the Gaza envelope to kind of understand, you know, these, the geopolitical reality of uh, that region. We were able to engage with um, uh, residents of the Nativ Hasara kibbutz, I believe is, is the name of it, um, to understand what life is like living so close to Gaza. We also heard from uh, a resident of Gaza um, through the organization Gisha to also under try to tried to have some semblance of understanding of life in Gaza for Palestinians. We did many more things. I won't get into all of them, of course. Um, but basically the idea was to kind of fit everything into one trip, which is a really challenging thing to do. And because you can't fit everything in, a lot of what we did when we were on the bus was really try to kind of talk about uh, some of the things we might have missed. So that might, might have meant, you know, talking through uh, what it means to be a non-white Jewish person living inside of Israel, being a Mizrahi Jew, you know, um, uh, talking about the migrant experience from, uh, you know, from Russia, from Ethiopia, like just a variety of different things that we simply could not fit in, but were re really critical pieces to understanding the complexities, contradictions, uh, just realities of life in Israel and Palestine. Uh, so that was our 2019 trip and our day trips are typically uh, kind of also some parallels um, of what Sam mentioned, but, you know, going to Area C, going to the South Hebron Hills and understanding what displacement and occupation looks like for residents of Area C um, and also going to East Jerusalem, uh, the, the day trips uh, typically typically go to places like Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, which as Dana mentioned before, is in the news uh, quite a bit these days. And I think Sam, you also mentioned that. Um, so really, you know, showing people, here's the Jerusalem that you might be seeing through your Hebrew U university abroad experience, but this is also, you know, the East Jerusalem that exists uh, and that is under a consistent threat of eviction for a variety of residents. So thank you. Thank you, Abby. And Dan, do you have anything uh, to add on um, that? Just very briefly, uh, because you've kind of already covered everything. Um, Peace Now has under its auspices Settlement Watch, which is the largest and most extensive um, watchdog that actually monitors settlements on the ground. So our day-to-day -day work is very much about seeing where settlement building goes. So often these tours will include seeing places that are not even yet recorded on maps or not even known. It's, it's a very strange experience when you learn what the settlement means and what is actually the experience of seeing something that is not recorded but is actually changes people's lives, what it's like to lose land to something that is not publicly known. So we have that component. We do both research and activism, of course. And um, I think you explained so beautifully what, what goes on. I think one thing that's really important to say is that these tools are not just about seeing the most. You can't see everything, not even if you came for a year and you went every day. It's such a learned process and things change so fast. Um, but there is an experience of just being both in, in an occupied territory and seeing what it's like for the residents to have their lives change and have no control over processes that happen to them every day and seeing the discourses from the other side and seeing the silencing of that. And I think, you know, East Jerusalem has been mentioned a lot. Shaked Morag, who's the executive director of Peace Now, says that Jerusalem is the microcosm of this conflict, which I think is a very eloquent way to look at it. And when you walk around the sort of beautified west side of the city and you don't remember that there is an east, it's a completely different experience. And then you cross and you see, and it's a very different experience because you don't have a checkpoint, you just walk through 
and you see a completely different way of life. You understand what occupation can mean every day, every minute of the day for people living under control. I would like to open the floor to Adam and Ariel, uh, our young participants who went on Extend and J Street uh, trips. Um, so can you please tell us what uh, tour you participated in and share something that surprised you on the trip? Uh, so we'll start with Adam. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, I'm Adam. Thank you so much uh, for having me and it's been a, a real pleasure. Of course, I, I know Abby um, quite well at this point, but it's been a real pleasure, Dana and Sam, to, uh, to hear about your, your organizations. And of course, when we were in Israel, we got to uh, work with, with, with Shalom Achshav, with Peace Now, with Chagit, and it was just, uh, of course, uh, heartbreaking, but still uh, just transformational uh, and, and wonderful because of that. So I, I, yes, I went on the uh, Letter People Know trip in 2019 with J Street, um, and uh, it was it was it was incredible. It was it was it was it was very moving, and um, I, I think that Ariel needs to introduce herself, so I won't say more. But yes. Hi, um, I'm Ariel. I went on a gap year this past year. I went on Young Today Year course, which I think is the largest, if not one of the largest, like gap year programs that happens in Israel. And while being there, I also went on a birthright tour that was organized through um, Gear Course. Um, and while being there, I got involved in some different anti-occupation organizations that led me to extend. Um, and Sam was super flexible and generous to lead um, about 30 of my peers and I on a, um, a day, we went to, um, explore Hebron on a uh, Breaking the Sounds tour, and we went to Hanal Akmar, Hanal Akmar, yeah, um, on a um, really inspiring um, visit to kind of see what solidarity looks like there. It was a really impactful day, I think, not just for myself, but for um, all my peers who got to see, you know, Palestinians maybe for the first time, or who got to kind of see this stark contrast from what we were learning about and the narrative that we heard from on our gap year program um, versus, you know, the real truth of what was going on. Um, and to see it firsthand, I think was really um, super meaningful. Yeah. That really sounds meaningful. Um, and Ariel, can, can you also tell us a, a memorable moment from the trip, something that you took with you? Yeah, of course. Um, I think like I said before, this idea of a real contrast, we lived as like, you know, American visitors. We got all the privileges of um, being a visitor. You know, we got to pray in Jerusalem and, you know, party in Tel Aviv, visit the Negev, and we could do this all without seeing any of the complexities of the occupation. It was, I think the systems which privileged us as visitors um, and afforded us the sense of belonging in a place that was not our own homes. Um, we got to see these same systems that really disenfranchise and harm Palestinians. Um, these, we saw these two realities. We saw they can't be like extricated from one another. I think that was really impactful. And I also think seeing in Hanan Akmar, seeing this, we visited basically, and we got to meet um, Dan Turner, who's this like settler turned activist there. Um, and also a Bedouin Palestinian, Abu Hamis. Um, and we got to kind of experience their um, friendship and experience the way that they um, created um, real like grassroots change and movement in the place that they both called home, which were very close to one another. Um, and I think that seeing that and then being able to, as a group, um, through, you know, the leadership of Extend and the, um, to our guides that we had, be able to unpack together and really understand um, what this meant for us as people who were gonna go and you know go onto college campuses the next year, be faced whether we liked it or not with a whole slew of questions and you know accusations about what we did um, and how we spent our year. I think it's really important that we were um, you know, informed and were, you know, getting offered this whole truth that exists that was, you know, omitted or 
really downplayed by the this big program that we were on, um, both when we toured on Birthright and both when we toured on our gap year program. Thank you. It really sounds like you were able to witness multiple perspectives. And Adam, uh, back to you. Um, can you share a memorable um, moment from the trip or something that changed your perspective about Israel and Palestine? Yes, I could probably spend all day doing that, Daniela. Um, it was just, it was incredible. I mean, I think that to pick one moment is really, really, really challenging. I mean, you know, Abby and I kind of talked about this before and I don't know, I think I picked five moments when we talked about it. And, um, but, but I, I keep coming back to this idea of, of um, balance and, and the, the idea that um, in North America, and as in my experience as, as an American Jew, there is a lot of um, discussion about how can we educate people in a balanced way so that they're seeing both sides or that there's the idea that, you know, you're going to get Palestinian, you're going to get Israeli, you're going to get, you know, kind of some of both. And, and the reality is that there's, there's no perfect balance. There's no perfect mix and there are not two sides. There are... I would say almost an infinite amount of competing factions and um, uh, interests and people and narratives and agendas that are <laughs> gasping for air, land, space, water, um, and resources, and and finding you know re reaching that conclusion that there there is no balance. There is just each person's and community's lived reality. Um, the, the, what, what is balanced for an American Jew about traveling to Israel and, and Palestine is markedly different from someone who, you know, a, a Palestinian living in Hebron or an East Jerusalemite or some Israeli living outside or living in the, you know, in the Gaza envelope. And so, um, you know, kind of what, what, I've been able to do in the now two years since the trip is kind of synthesize all of this into, I don't know, something about, uh, you know, just, just this sort of realization that, you know, each, each person and each community um, has, has this, uh, you know, very distinct view of, of, of what the reality is, what the truth is, because when we met with settlers, <laughs> you know they they have they have their own narrative they have their own their own truth that they you know fully believe they're not um they 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 don't have this you know kind of like you know um they're not evil in the sense that it's not it's not clear cut there's lots of gray areas you know we and and the same goes for for people who are living in in Area C? I mean, this is these these these. This is so complex and so and and I don't say that as a conversation stopper, but rather as a starter because it's um, to meet with all these people. What I'm saying, you know, is is to meet with all these people, myriad people. You know, in in Jerusalem, we, you know, we met with Armenians, we we met with Christians, we met with with Muslims, we met with Jews, and you know, Jews of all stripes, Russian. Haredi, um, secular, all, all across the spectrum. I mean, everybody has um, a, a competing narrative and claim um, to, to this land. And um, that was, so I don't think that's a one moment thing. <laughs> I think I kind of didn't really answer your question, Daniela. But um, I, I hope that, I hope what I've said makes sense that because this is, I hope you can tell this, that this was a, a clearly, impactful and and an important um and trip for me to go on and and really changed how i uh, view the region even though i was you know a, a lefty to begin with you know how i how i view the region and and how i view um uh just us as as north americans learning about it and our involvement with it so um thank you adam it's um wonderful answer to a very difficult question and must have been a difficult trip but um, now I'm going to uh, uh, turn this over to Bradley. Uh, go ahead. Yeah thanks a lot uh, Ariella and Adam for sharing those really meaningful experiences that you had 
on your trips. Um, so my next question is for Abby and for Sam. Um, it's been a long wait, but now finally at last, the vaccinations are being administered. We'll be able to leave our homes in North America and start traveling to other countries. So we'd like to know uh, if your organizations have specific plans for restarting uh, youth travel experiences in the post-COVID era. Um, Abby, you could go ahead first. Sure, so I will give you a very quick answer and let Sam speak a bit more. We, for uh, the indefinite future, it looks like we are not going to be continuing our uh, longer term trips and our day trips. Um, but I really encourage people to go on Peace Now, Shalom Akhshav trips and extend trips because it's just such an important way to understand the reality of the occupation and what Israel looks like on the ground. So Sam. Thanks, Abi. Um, so we, the answer is actually we've already run programs. So the program that Ariel went on um, was in April. So this, um, we're not bringing North Americans to Israel-Palestine yet, although that will happen later in the year. But um, because there were almost 10,000 North American Jews in Israel on gap year programs, as soon as um, vaccine, vaccines were fully distributed and it was possible to run programs, um, we started doing that. So we ran, I think, four programs for almost 150 people uh, this spring. And then we had to stop because of this latest round of violence and we're starting again now. And we'll have programs for um, people who come off of birthright trips from August forward. And I think it's, it's really, really important that as many people as possible get this experience. I think it's so, so common for North American Jews to spend time in Israel and really never meet the people who most share their values. And to me, that's one of the, you know, it's, it's great listening to Adam and Ariel talk about their powerful experiences. And I think something that I really heard was the way that you each connected your values with people, Israelis and Palestinians. And I think so often because birthright has a particular political agenda, it's not opening up those connections and it's diverting people towards the way it wants to be. It wants Israel to be seen. Um, and I think there's nothing neutral about it. And, um, and there are, there's a very particular political agenda. So I, I think we're, we're back, we're running programs. We're very excited to be expanding the range of opportunities open to young American uh, North American Jews. And we'd be really happy to have anyone who wants to be part of our work. Just very briefly for me to say that the main obstacle we faced was not COVID, but the recent escalation and security concerns. Um, we're very aware of what's going on and we never endanger people. So just so you know, if you're coming with, on a tour with us, we know that things are okay. Um, we also had a very um, lengthy gap because of Ramadan. We don't do tours during Ramadan out of respect um, to communities we work with. So we are now getting started again after things have slightly calmed down. You know, everything is relative here. Um, and I, I'll put in the chat our website and feel free to get in touch because we are running trips again. And if you happen to make your way here, you're very welcome to join on one of our tours. We run English speaking tours as well. So just, you know. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'm glad that uh, as people who are attending the, this webinar will have the opportunity to participate in these trips uh, very shortly. And uh, Dana, I actually have another question for you just before we, uh, uh, we continue with the audience questions. Um, I'd like to know if you could talk a little bit about what impact alternative tours such as yours might have on the relationship between diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews. Thank you for that question. It's a really important one. I think we understand so much the importance of both sides, both Jews and actually it's more than two sides, as, as Adam said, there's an infinity a number of perspectives, all sides involved in these relationships to, to really experience the diversity of other sides. Um, and I think in order to have a true connection and to understand what's going on, you really have to experience things for yourself and showing just a partial view and showing only one side of the board that doesn't allow you to connect with the actual experience. And, um, I think and I feel that these tools actually strengthen some kind of commitment to a progressive Israel, to an Israel that lives in peace, uh, to an Israel that believes in the right of all peoples to exist in their land with their own rights protected um, and not to live in fear. So, you know, it's really important to say 
we are, you know, I, I returned home after 13 years of living abroad. I, I love living here. It's my home. We are not against anything in any way. We are a Zionist um, movement. But we do believe that the only way that Israel can sustain itself in the future is by living in peace in the two-state solution. That is the vision that we offer participants of our tours. So we hope that that strengthens, if you will, a kind of relationship into in, in Israel that we would want to live in. Yeah, thank you for sharing those reflections. It really does seem that these trips can strengthen the bonds between Israel and diaspora in a ways that perhaps other trips uh, wouldn't be able to. Um, before we go ahead to the audience questions, we have a little bit of time if maybe Abby and Sam want to share uh, some quick reflections on the same question about the relationship between diaspora and Israel, how that could be impacted from these trips, uh, just very quickly. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll, so I, I think this, is, this was said earlier by both Donna and Sam, but I think one of the aims of our trip uh, in 2019 and the day trips in general was really to make sure that um, our participants were engaging with um, Israeli leftists, Jewish Israeli leftists, to understand how committed, devoted, how much just difficulty they face on a daily basis in being on, you know, being slightly ostracized from mainstream society by actively fighting against the occupation. And also the way in which they reflect their progressive values is so similar to our participants who are really committed to climate justice, who are really committed to Black Lives Matter, who are committed to a host of progressive issues that aren't necessarily Israel-Palestine. And so I think the ability to communicate with people who are doing so much of a similar work, just you know, across many thousands of miles, is a really important way to strengthen the ties. And I will just say, and you know, Adam and I spoke the other day, uh, you know, in, in preparation for this uh, conversation, but I think a lot of our participants were really motivated by this trip. Um, you know, we had people who, you know, from Hillel presidents to, um, you know, people who are more or less engaged with the conflict on their various campuses, who really felt invigorated and inspired to want to affect change, you know, to want to explain to their Jewish communities that they grew up in what's what's going on in Israel, Palestine, and a lot of that had to do with the conversations they had with um, Jewish Israelis that um, that they were that they interacted with, uh, and so I think. You know, I, I don't think these trips run the risk at all of polarizing um, young Jews from Israel. If anything, it strengthens them. And I think, you know, when you show someone um, the truth, um, you know, as Sam said, the, the birthrights agenda is highly politicized. The choice of omitting and erasing Palestinian voices and excluding them from the narrative of Israel is a political act. To only focus on one narrative is a political act in and of itself. And I think to really show people the truth and allow them to authentically engage with the reality of Israel-Palestine is the surest way to strengthen and solidify uh, diaspora and uh, relations between uh, Israeli communities as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I think um, what Abby said about the connections between justice work in the US and Israel-Palestine is so, so important. And I think for me, it always comes back to values. What are the shared values? And I think one of the really uh, unfortunate effects of birthright is that so many people are, so many North American Jews are introduced to Israel-Palestine through values that they don't share, right? They're, and it's not, you know, I, I think, uh, what, what Abby's saying about it being a political choice, it's a, it's a really intentional choice on Birthright's part, right? I mean, we all know, it's not a secret, Birthright's biggest donors are allied with Likud, they're allied with the right wing, those are the speakers you hear from, that's the narrative that you hear, and I think um, it's the left shouldn't cede that and say, well, that's the traditional Israel programming or the conventional trip. We should say, no, that's what a right wing uh, or center right programming to Israel looks like. And we're offering something really different. We're saying connect with people who share your social justice values, connect with people who share your progressive human rights values. And they're here, right? They're, they're, and, and they're also eager to meet you and they see you as North American Jews as having an important role to play um, in the future of Israel-Palestine. I think that's so, so important. So for me, part of what I've been most proud of in Extend's work over the years is the alumni who go on to leadership roles with J Street U, or If Not Now, um, or Open Hillel, or who take their experiences and do other justice work 
that's more broadly connected um, to, to creating a better world. And I think that's really, really important. So for, to me, it always comes back to values. And I think also to expand the question a little bit, I think it's not just about creating that connection with Jewish Israelis. It's also about opening up a deeper connection with everyone uh, who lives in Israel, Palestine. And I think that connecting with Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem or the West Bank or in Gaza is no less important. And that's really, really crucial. So that's, um, I, I think that's really important work. And it's great that um, J Street um, and Peace Now are, are, are doing it as well. And I'm really proud to be part of this broader movement. Thank yeah, you. Thanks so much for uh, sharing those important reflections. And uh, now I'll pass it on to Daniela, who will uh, be asking some questions from the audience. Uh, thanks, Bradley. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions um, about the trips themselves uh, from the chat. So one question is, uh, how long do the trips last? Um, I assume it's not the day trips, but uh, kind of the longer program for extend and let, let our people know. Um, and what is the funding? How are they being funded uh, compared to birthright? And if you also visit uh, the typical touristy places in Israel, like uh, the Dead Sea, Tel Aviv, and yeah. So Abby, we can start with you. Sure. Uh, so we, so the Let Our People Know trip was 10 days. Uh, I actually, I, I realized I didn't really give uh, much of background of the impetus for, for putting on the Let Our People Know trip. So I'm actually just going to do that. So we did a 10 day trip, which is the same uh, length of time that birthright trips run, uh, 10 full days. And so this Let Our People Know trip came actually from a campaign, a student campaign initiative from J Street U which is J Street's student organizing arm. And they had a request from their Hillels on their university campuses, which was, you know, because a lot of the Hillels actually organize birthright trips. Um, you know, they asked uh, on the, the summer and winter trips that are run by uh, the Hillels, uh, could they please bring on Palestinian speakers? And so uh, the, the you know, it, it sort of depended on where, which university you were at, but ultimately it was, it was a decision at the top from Birthright that was, or, and Hillel International that was, um, you know, organizing these tours. And so uh, J Street U recommended a list of possible Palestinian speakers that were, you know, our partners, uh, Palestinian residents of Area C, um, a variety of different people that we work with and that come to our uh, national conferences. Um, and, and engage with our uh, leaders of the movement. So when there were a lot of uh, no's um, received by the thought of having Palestinian speakers uh, join the birthright trips as speakers, um, the students uh, pushed back and, and we actually managed to raise enough money, uh, which I'll explain after, to put on this Let Our People Know trip. And the purpose of the trip was to uh, basically prove a concept uh, which was to create a model trip of what it could like to have an inclusive trip that allows students to engage with an authentic Israel, meaning that you see uh, the occupation uh, firsthand and that you do not shy away from the complexities uh, and the contradictions of being in Israel-Palestine. And so that was the impetus for the trip. Um, to go back to the question about funding, I wrote it down because I just wanted to make sure um, we it was 75% supported by a grassroots fundraising effort and 25% was supported by an anonymous donor. Uh, the total trip cost about 160,000 US dollars and we had uh, 30 participants on the trip, which is actually pretty typical of um, the number of participants on a birthright trip. Um, and so that's the funding aspect. In terms of the um, the other question was about if you visit uh, other locations uh, that or are traditional typical. or touristy locations mm -hmm. such as the Dead Sea, Tel Aviv, Masada, and the sure. like. Sure. Yes, um, I will make this part quick. So we um, we did we visited many. We visited the Kinneret, you know, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we visited um, Jerusalem, of course. We visited the Dead Sea. Um, but, you know, and we also visited Tel Aviv. Visiting uh, Tel Aviv, though, we, we went to Jaffa, um, which was, you know, a really important way to understand sort of this mixed city, you know, a lot of, you know, a place 
place where a lot of the intercommunal violence is actually taking place today. Um, and we were given a tour by a um, sort of unique hip hop group um, uh, that has members, Palestinian members, Russian members, Ethiopian members, um, to kind of talk about um, what it means to be a resident of Jaffa. Um, and we also went to the Dead Sea, which was uh, also a, a conscious decision on our part. The Dead Sea was in the West Bank, um, which meant that we wanted to show our participants that most Israelis don't really think about when they go to the Dead Sea, they're actually going to the West Bank. And it's just part of, you know, when I was a kid, we, we went on family trips to the Dead Sea and there was no question about whether or not um, you were entering into the West Bank. So, you know, a lot of our decisions and the, the places that we went were reflected a lot of the typical places that um, birthright participants might go to. But for us, it was, there was always, uh, you know, an and. So, you know, what does it mean that we're here? Why did we choose this place? And, you know, a conversation about why we were there and why we chose that location. So I hope that answers all of the questions. Uh, Sam, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that funding is something that people often don't talk about, but it's a really important part of this story. Birthright has a multi multi dollar million dollar budget every year. And one of the reasons that they get to control the narrative around this is because they've put more resources into it. So Extend is an extremely small grassroots organization. We raise about $200,000 every year, and that lets us bring usually about 150 people on one, three, and five day program. So we are a very small nonprofit. We're supported mainly by grassroots donors. Our, our median contribution is $35. If you are so moved, you can donate at extendprograms.org slash donate. Um, but we're a very grassroots uh, project. And I think something that I've learned through that is we've never had a year where we didn't have more people who wanted to go on the program than we could pay for. Young American Jews and North American Jews really want this sort of experience. And I think, um, I'm sure Donna and Abby, you guys see that in your work all the time. People, young, young North American Jews really want to connect with Israel, Palestine through their values, but the infrastructure isn't there, right? Like Extend, um, J Street, all these organizations were competing with massive, massively funded organizations. And, and it's, it's really hard. It's really hard um, to, to raise the resources to make these sorts of trips happen. And I think it's, it's, to be honest, I think it's a bit of a political failure that um, we sort of bemoan the way that Sheldon Adelson has been able to dominate this debate, but um, not, not enough people or organizations putting the resources to create an alternative. So um, I hope that if you believe in this project at large, that um, you'll, even if it's just that $35 donation, that goes a long way towards getting more and more people on the program. Just to say briefly on our side, we don't run the longer programs, but we do, um, we just ask for a symbolic donation on the day. And a lot of it is, by the way, to ensure that people who want to come actually want to come and we don't have um, people who want to start violence and that has happened. So it's a way to, to ensure that people are actually committed to the tour. Um, but I join comrades on the call saying that we do need support. Um, all movements are kind of, you know, there is a gross inequality between the organized far right and the grassroots left. Um, so if you are moved by the stories you're hearing, especially I'm, I'm very, very grateful for to hear Ariel and Adam's perspectives, which I think really kind of showed why these things are so important, these experiences are so important, um, do support those who are trying to offer something different to that other industry. And we also have a question from the chat. Uh, if these programs, uh, Abby and Sam, if they're open to Canadians as well and people who already spend uh, gap years of different kinds in Israel? Yes, to both. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. We have a question from Barbara. Uh, she's asking, uh, what are some of the obstacles you may have faced when suggesting Extend and J Street alternative tours to Jewish organizations in North America, and especially synagogues? Uh, what are the best approaches to overcoming these obstacles? I would have to say, I, I think this is something that I touched on earlier about the the, the over 
overarching concern that we heard was this trip will dissuade young Jews from actively engaging with Israel and feeling a sense of connection to Israel. And so I think, you know, the way to prove and, and sort of, you know, reassure these, these people from the organized Jewish community or synagogues or what have you is um, much of what uh, we all discussed before about the importance of engaging um, authentically with um, Israeli Jewish activists who are doing this work and the importance of, uh, and, and as Sam said, as also engaging with Palestinian voices and narratives and how um, visiting, you know, Israel, Palestine and, and seeing these alternative truths doesn't dissuade people at large um, from having a, a deeper connection to Israel. If anything, it just solidifies those bonds. And so what we did actually was a lot of report backs uh, to synagogues where, and I think Adam, you, you did this a couple of times as well, um, but we had our participants uh, come and share their stories, share their experiences, um, and, and really also dig into some of the uncomfortable questions that, you know, let's say synagogue congregants um, might have had. Um, and so I think it was a really important way also for um, our, the student participants, you know, who were respected members of their respective Jewish communities, you know, people wanted to hear from them, they wanted to hear from their experiences, and it was a really great way um, for their, you know, fears to be um, sort of uh, um, dismissed and, you know, to see just how strengthened um, the relationships uh, between our participants and the, their connection to Israel-Palestine was, so. And if I could jump in just to say that, you know, it, it's hard, to, I mean, the, 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 I will say like birthright is a right wing, you know, kind of machine. Um, and it's like incredibly well funded and it's done an incredible job at getting their message out. That being said, it always surprises me how insecure they are that like, a little trip, like J Street's Let Our People Know trip, completely rocked them. You know, that like they, here are 30, you know, young American Jews going to Israel, Palestine to talk with, you know, quote, both sides. And <laughs> we, we just ran into all kinds of, you know, obstacles there and, and coming back from people who are like, well, you know, the, the, why, why, why can't you be traditional? Why, why can't you do this? There are there's so many more ways to relate to the land of Israel uh, and and Israel Palestine, you know, as they're in their, their the current iteration of nation states and a nascent um, state. Is that there there, is, there are more ways to relate to that place than just through a right wing perspective, and we absolutely must reject this idea that you know the right wing perspective is the only way to that that it is positive because it's not it's it's not truthful um it's it's not honest and it's not positive because we know as as you know americans and canadians that our patriotism and our love for our countries th th this is a complex love that we feel and so we we, we don't have just positive feelings towards you know our, our country we, we have this very complex, um, you know, relationship with it. And to develop that relationship with Israel-Palestine is just as important. And so to do it only in a, a positive way or a traditional right-wing way is really robbing people of, of a very important opportunity. Thank you for that, Adam. So right now we are at uh, 12 at noon. So I just want to ask our panelists if you have uh, a few minutes to answer some more questions or if we should conclude. Um, so raise your thumb if you're okay. Okay, excellent. So now we'll go uh, to Penny's question. Uh, and she's sharing that her sons are reluctant to go to Israel uh, for safety reasons. Uh, and she's asking how can she encourage her sons to go and what are the safety measures uh, that your trips undertake uh, with the organization? Uh, so we can start with Sam. Yeah, sure. So um, 
I'll explain a number of the safety measures um, that we put in place. But I think to start, it's really important to emphasize, I think for a lot of North American Jews, the West Bank is a scary place and we associate with violence and all these sorts of things. Um, there are 2 million international visitors who go to the West Bank every year. Um, Bethlehem is a major international tourist destination because of Christian sites. So I think it's, it's um, security is real and it's serious and we should talk about it and I'll explain the measures that we take. But I also think it's important to think through the reasons why it's presented as so scary or so frightening to go to the West Bank or East Jerusalem. Um, when if you go to those places, you'll find lots of international tourists and NGO workers and it's not a scary or frightening place to be. With that said, we do have security measures, of course. Um, so the most important one is our partnerships with particular communities. When I was first starting this work, I went around and asked all of the organizations who did programs in the West Bank. Um, so how do you keep people safe? Like, do you have an armed guard? Do you, um, you know, do you have an organization that goes ahead of you? What do you do? And almost all of them gave the same answers. They said, all of those things can make you feel good if you're on a bus. But the only thing that will keep you really safe is your relationships with the communities that you're visiting. And um, anytime before we go somewhere, I'm on the phone saying, you know, hey, is it a good day? What's going on? Is there any reason we shouldn't go? Is there a protest plan that maybe there's a chance will turn into a confrontation with the military? So I think having those open lines and that communication is really essential um, to, to keeping everyone safe. And I'm really proud to say that in eight years of programming with more than 600 people, um, we've never had anything, we've never had a security incident. And I think that's because of our really, really strong relationships with the communities that are, are welcoming us in. And Abby uh, for J Street. Sure. Um, so on our trip, we, you know, a, a lot of what Sam said, you know, there was a lot of pre conversations with our participants about what one can expect and sort of conversations about, um, you know, eradicating certain preconceived notions about what it means to go to the West Bank. Um, and we actually made the conscious choice to have security um, in some of our uh, visits. And when we went to the West Bank, for instance, we did not. Um, in part because of the of how, what that symbolizes for Palestinians. It's a very triggering experience to see an Israeli military or, or an armed rather, not military uh, personnel along with a group. Um, you know, this was something that we, we spoke about with our participants. We, we were transparent in our conscious decision not to uh, bring security. Uh, we did have a security guard when we walked around Jerusalem. Um, and we had security when we went to the settlement. Um, and those were the moments that we had uh, security, armed security with us. Um, but for the most part, just to reiterate, it was really a conscious choice to exclude security. And we really wanted to have a conversation about, you know, optic in terms of optics, what it means to have security with a group of young American Jews. And maybe uh, just to turn this question to Ariel and Adam, um, maybe tell us about how did you feel uh, safe or uh, how did you feel safe or comfortable during the trips? Um, so Ariel, you can go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, I felt completely safe. I think it was also really interesting to have those conversations like Abby was just mentioning about the optics and what it means. Um, you know, I remember being on the bus and people were asking questions because normally when we travel around as a group, we have a security guard and we're on a bulletproof bus and this is like something that we talk about. Um, and I think a few kids brought it up just, I don't think out of feelings of like, you know, fear of safety, but I think just around like, oh, this looks different than when we normally travel together. What does this mean? Why are we like, I think it was really actually more of a, I don't think people felt unsafe. I think people felt totally safe. And I think it was actually um questions of safety were really interesting and rich for um conversation i think more than um any real fear about you know physical safety or anything like that yeah i felt totally safe i would say i would not i didn't i did not feel unsafe but i was i i recognized the fact that i was not 
I was no longer just like a white person in the United States. I was in a different region with a completely different context and relationship to military presence, to violence in general. And so um, uh, I think that I, I felt just like a, maybe, maybe a heightened awareness of that um, and to, you know, or, or just, just kind of feeling, you know, a, a little, you can feel, you can feel the tension in the area. So that's not something that can be ignored. That, that didn't make me feel unsafe, but it's an important part of the experience. Um, and, 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 and really important to, to recognize that, I think. So um, that being said, I felt completely different when I came back to the States and we landed at JFK and I was like, wow, I feel very safe here, which was, which was a, a really odd experience for me. I mean, you know, I, I, I had never really been in a place where, first of all, you know, it's tiny and it, it's surrounded by, um, you know, other countries, some of which are, have, you know, friendly relationships with, with, with Israel and some do not. And so it's, it's, it's just a very, it's a very different experience. And I, I don't think that, you know, I, I never felt unsafe. I knew that I was protected. I knew that, that, um, that our staff had, had been very, very diligent about that. But it, it's, it's important to recognize that the, the safety that we might feel in North America is completely different, I think, from the safety that, um, you know, people would feel in that region. Just, just, just very different. Yeah, I also, yeah. I just want to add something really, really quickly. I think the tension is definitely felt, and I also want to say that when I traveled with Extend and with other organizations to the West Bank um, on, like, you know, explorative anti-occupation trips, the only times that I actually felt like fearful or um, you know, I felt this tension really heighten or, you know, that feeling in your stomach was encounters that I had with settlers or with police or with soldiers. Um, and I, I felt that definitely, but I want to say I never felt that with um, other groups that we encountered, um, and especially the people who welcomed us into um, and who we heard from. Um, I just wanted to add that, like, I think there were definitely kind of more scary moments that I had, but those encounters were the only ones I can remember were ones that I had with settlers um, and with like police and with IDF soldiers. I just wanted to add that too. And that's important because the, the left wing does not necessarily have this like rosy relationship with security in the region. And like when, when I got on, I, I went through like at least two rounds of heightened like extra security questions to get on the plane because I had a, I had visited Morocco earlier that year and I had a stamp on my passport and they didn't like that on El Al and, um, you know, went through all of my bags and took out all of my stuff and that sort of stuff. But I think I'm, I think I'm getting cut off here. So um, anyway, feel safe. Thank you so much for all your answers. Uh, oh, sorry. Dana, so we do have a question for you from the chat. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Um, so just to add to the safety question, uh, David or David is asking, uh, since the second intifada, is there less person to person contact or relationship building between Jewish Israelis, Israeli Arabs and Palestinian and Palestinians and Palestinian Americans? Uh, so all of those different groups. So that's a great question. I want and I'm going to connect it to the question about safety, because I think they're very much interrelated and to say for Palestinians, there's no such thing as a safe life under occupation. It's a daily um, ordeal of dealing with a lot of uncertainty. One of our closest comrades in Silwan was just arrested today. No reason. Police arrived in his house and just um, asked him to come along. And um, we work, our way to ensure safety is to work very closely with Palestinian organizers and to know that there is trust and that we, we are not imposing on people and we are not infringing on, on them. But, you know, to project the idea that you can come to a place in which a lot of the population is feeling unsafe on a daily basis would be to once again mislead and give a false narrative. And that really connects to, to David's question. Thank you for that. That's a really important question. Um, there's been a lot of changes over the past, I would say, few decades even. And um, the good and bad thing about this place is that things can change within months. So, you know, you probably... I'm sure if you've come to this webinar, you know that we've had a period of very 
a strong escalation, both within um, cities in which there are Palestinian citizens of Israel and Israelis, and within the West Bank and towards um, Israel missiles being thrown to the south over a very long period of time, and even towards other places um, such as Tel Aviv. And, um, you know, I think in a strange way that actually increased more contact between Palestinian citizens of Israel and Jews, at least internally. And um, between Palestinians in Area C in East Jerusalem, things are more complicated. And I think there's an awareness, my reading is that there's an awareness that there are different connections and that, that there is a very active intervention in these connections. So, you know, just before the escalation started, I went on several tours of Sudan and there was really, you know, different kind of people were coming on tours and the different kind of conversations were starting and people became very aware. And then, of course, the events in Sheikh Jarrah kind of made East Jerusalem become an international um, center of attention. Um, so I, I'm still an optimist, I don't know why, but I still am. And I think the fact that there's a very active attempt to stop these connections means that people are really trying to establish them. And it's really important to support them and to allow them to happen. Because in the end of the day, we are all living here and we have to live, learn to live together. Palestinians living everywhere and Jews living um, within the boundaries of the Green Line. So, it's not easy, but we are working really, really hard to sustain these connections, despite a lot of obstacles. Thank you very much, Dana. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this really fascinating and informative uh, discussion. Uh, thank you to Daniela for all your efforts organizing this event. And last but not least, thanks to all of you in the audience for attending this webinar. Um, I'd like to ask you to please visit our website, peacenowcanada.org our Instagram page and our Facebook page to learn more about us and please consider a donation because we count entirely on the support of people like you. Please stay tuned for more great webinars in the coming weeks and months and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. All the very best.